Okay, welcome to everybody. I think now we can start. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone to attend today's event organized by the Artificial Intelligence Student Society. Uh, I am Andrea Gasparini. I'm the president of this association currently. Today, as we all, yes, know, we all know, we have, we have. Uh, um, the privilege to have Professor Andrea Cavallaro at the uh, Queen Mary University of London, who will talk uh, to us about adversarial attacks and ethical implications. And um, after that, we will have one of our PhD students, Geneva Carbone, who will give us an introduction to Bayesian neural networks and uh, robustness of the models to adversarial attacks. I will pass on straight away the word to our guest but first of all we have another special guest which is the coordinator of the data science uh, and uh, scientific computer coordinator and professor Bortolucci most of you know him who will give us an overview a quick overview of what will be in the in the future um, the new activities of unity s in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence professor Bortolucci are you ready of course, always. So thanks, Andrea. I have to say that um, uh, I'm very happy to um, be here, not um, just for the event itself, which is super interesting, but in general for the existence of this event that 
uh, is happening because uh, there is a lot of students which are uh, you know uh, very committed and uh, have a lot of fun in um, doing their activities and uh, not only studying but also you know learning different ways and this association is a great uh, I would say spin-off of uh, uh, the master in data science scientific computing so I'm very very proud of you guys um, so I will do a bit of uh, uh, screen sharing if uh, mm, that works oh don't tell me if that works I hope um, um, was not uh, sharing. Wait a second. Does he want preferences? <sighs> okay, so now I have a problem with slides, very bad. I didn't try this before. This is a bit bizarre because I was uh, maybe it's a new installation of this stupid thing. Okay. Um, if uh, this is uh, not going to work, I will probably not use the slides. Then, in any case, it's not that uh, uh, fundamental. But uh, let's see. Just a second. Then. No worries. I think Google failed today, so I, I think Microsoft wants to. Okay, now Microsoft would like me to restart everything so to to get uh, out and in. For some reason, he he, he lost the, the the settings in the computer. Well, never mind. Um, I will not use the slides, uh, which is anyway we're not containing many information. So what's happening? What's happening here in uh, in uh, in Trieste well, then? Um, well, fundamentally, you know, all started in a sense uh, four years ago with, uh, with the beginning of the master in data science and scientific computing, which is um, a master program international and uh, actually jointly organized with CISA, ICTP. There's also University of Udine helping, and uh, we also have uh, now our science park and uh, enough uh, as uh, teaching partners. Some companies like Stake are providing courses, so it's it's a big initiative, I would say, of the university, but it's a big initiative of the system of research of Trieste, which is, as you know, um, one of the most uh, rich, at least in terms of density. Uh, of uh, institutions uh, and, in fact, even of researchers in Italy and in Europe. So the um, this master was, uh, you know, studied and uh, quickly, I'll say, from second year on, uh, in a sense, took over. Uh, the number of students is good for for the University of Trieste is increasing, increased all the years, and we are about uh, the this year we have about fifty students and. Uh, Master has three curricula. There's one in uh, data science and applications. One is in computational science and engineering. And then from this year, we also have a curriculum in artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is more dedicated, let's say, to machine learning and its applications and different phases, phases of it. And this uh, is already great, but uh, now we're not happy with just this. So we moved forward. Uh, and uh, since this year, we also have a bachelor program in artificial intelligence and data analytics, which will be naturally providing part of uh, uh, the inflow of students in the master program. Uh, so we still want to have students with different backgrounds emerging and uh, contaminating each other, which is a lot of fun, I think. Uh, it's what happening in the master now. So if you're a physicist, a mathematician, a statistician, an engineer, you're very welcome. And you will still uh, remain very welcome. But uh, so this already gives you uh, three plus two years of formation in this area. But no, we're not happy with that. And there will be something new starting next year in 2021, which uh, may be of interest to all of you, which is a PhD program. 
So it's going to be there's going to be a PhD program in um, applied data science and artificial intelligence. So a program a little bit more focused on uh, well, say on artificial intelligence and data science and their applications. So there will be uh, I mean, theoretical research going on and let's say applications or connections also with, uh, with industries and uh, uh, other research institutions in the area. With uh, likely there will be three curricula within the uh, PhD program focused on uh, uh, let's say three different branches of application. So one will be industry for the zero smart city smart transportations and hard sciences, whatever it means. So applications in science. Um, another one would be uh, uh, more focused on medicine, life sciences, environment. Third one, more focused on economy and society. So depending on your taste, this ensures everything for you. And theory will be spread throughout all this uh, curricula. So that's the, that's the idea. It uh, somehow follows a bit the structure of the Italian National Program on Artificial Intelligence, which is also going to start in 2021. And also there, I mean, we are, we, we, as the University of Trieste, we are trying to, to participate. We probably we will. So we will also be involved in this national program, uh, PhD in artificial intelligence. And um, well, I would say uh, this is more or less it for the moment, which is already quite a lot of things going on. So if you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, maybe a PhD or maybe a PhD uh, done within a company though, so more on applied research, uh, now there's, there is a sensible chance for you here in Trieste. And with this, I would say, uh, what we have, I'm kind of completing this, the more things will happen in the future, I think, but uh, I am, for the moment we are happy <laughs> with what we are having here. So, um, what's going to be the next step? Well, next step is actually uh, today, uh, to enjoy what's going to come next. So there will be Professor Cavallaro and then Ginevra talking a little bit about the Versailles examples, as we know. Uh, as you know, the, the deep learning is, you know, uh, changing a lot the, the landscape of artificial intelligence and making several things, uh, um, several applications which were essentially impossible just a few years ago, actually now possible and more or less already on the market for, for some reasons. But there are some concerns about the reliability of this technology and some of these concerns are intrinsically uh, connected with the technology itself. I mean, with, the, with deep learning itself, with neural network itself, with the mathematics behind, with the actual tools that we're using. And other side examples are, you know, a big, uh, uh, play a big, other uh, attacks and other examples play a big role in this aspect because they make the, whenever they, 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 they are there, they make this technology intrinsically vulnerable to cyber attacks and to uh, so a bit fragile to be used in safety critical applications. So solving uh, research topics, something we are also working here in Trieste in collaboration with uh, colleagues in CISA actually. Um, so I think that uh, you will get better feeling of this uh, in the next two talks. So thanks uh, for the attention. Sorry for, for not having the slides uh, running. I just uh, was too optimistic with respect to Microsoft. And thanks for, as I said, for the attention, for I don't know, having uh, this great student association letting me um, speak, uh, just greet you at the beginning. So, you know, let's the, second part of the deep learning day start. Okay, thanks uh, Luca Bortolussi for the introduction. Without further ado, I will leave the work to, uh, I will pass on the torch to Andrea Cavallaro. He is a professor at the Queen Mary University of London, and he'll talk a bit about uh, adversarial attack, uh, touching on some uh, social ethical implication. So, thank you, Andrea, and whenever you wish, you can start. All right. Uh, thank you, Marco, for uh, the introduction. Uh, can you confirm you can see me and hear me well before I start yep. sharing the screen? And uh, are you still uh, seeing the presentation? Yeah. 
Okay, great. So if, if uh, uh, anybody would be kind enough to maintain their video stream on so that I can get uh, an immediate feedback, that would be uh, appreciated. I can see, I think, one person at the time. Um, that would be that would be great for me. Um, anyway, uh, good good afternoon, um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, in in your event today. It's uh, uh, great to hear uh, so many interesting uh, activities uh, going on uh, in Italy, and in particular uh, in uh, Trieste. Um, what I'll be uh, talking about uh, today is uh, um, classifiers, uh, which are uh, used now in in applications. Uh, we we are interacting with every day. So probably if you have an iPhone, you might use uh, AI between 50 and 70 times a day when you unlock your phone. If you're using Netflix, you get recommendations uh, about films uh, to watch. If you're using a spell checker, uh, certainly they're using AI behind the scene. If, if you're using a spam filter, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, then AI is, is playing behind the scene. So there are a lot of uh, very successful applications of deep learning classifiers. Um, however, those classifiers have got uh, some vulnerabilities, and today we will talk about, about those. But before starting, let's uh, see what uh, a classifier is in the context of uh, today's uh, presentation. So what you see there is uh, a box containing a, an artificial neural network um, that uh, we usually train using a, a substantial amount of uh, training data with a certain training process, which uh, is, is now a mixture between a science and, and an art. And the idea then is once the classifier is uh, selected in terms of architecture and values of the parameters of this architecture, um, you provide a certain uh, signal uh, in input and you obtain a classification result. In the uh, specific case of today's presentation, that classification result will be a categorical variable, uh, a one hot vector that represents a label uh, for uh, the signal. And today uh, we will talk as a signal uh, about images. Um, what we are interested in is about the robustness of this classifier M. Um, and for robustness, I mean the ability of the classifier M uh, to be able uh, to provide the same label uh, Y if we have perturbations in the input uh, signal uh, X. And in particular, we will uh, see two uh, applications of robustness, one towards the end uh, about uh, AI applied to self-critical systems, so systems who are um, capable of taking decisions in real time and must be robust. But what the presentation will focus on uh, today is particularly uh, the ethical aspects of AI. So uh, a lot of uh, companies, a lot of applications are probably moving faster than uh, the norms, the legislations and the rules uh, we uh, we use uh, to govern them. And therefore, at times, it might be better to equip a user with the ability uh, to protect uh, their own data. And that's what uh, is the focus of the presentation today. We will Um, intentionally perturb uh, signals that are of misleading one or more classifiers. What, what does this mean? Well, if we have an original signal, for example, uh, an image you might want to share uh, in a social media uh, platform, um, then uh, that uh, image will generate a certain uh, class label, say that image was taken uh, at, the, uh, at the seafront in, in Trieste, for example. Then uh, we want to uh, be able to create this uh, adversarial signal, this adversarial image, X dot, such that uh, the resulting classification is different from the original one. So if at the beginning it was a, a nice uh, image of the uh, seaside in Trieste, maybe uh, the uh, resulting uh, classification result of the adversarially perturbed image will be maybe it's in the mountains somewhere in, in Colorado. Um, and what we are interested today is how we craft these adversarial signals uh, in order for us to protect uh, those characteristics of the image when we don't want those characteristics to be automatically uh, inferred by classifiers of, of, any, of any type. So why do we care about this? Why do we want to mislead classifiers? It seems uh, to be uh, an inappropriate uh, activity uh, to do. Well, you're probably uh, all aware of uh, the amount of data we are sharing. Uh, those data uh, are used for a number of, of applications. For example, if you share your images in 
um, Instagram, in Facebook, uh, you would have uh, faces of people that are uh, detected and then uh, labeled according uh, to the, the identity. And that's certainly for some a good service in order to alert your friends of the type of uh, images you have shared. Uh, however, on those images, either a service provider or a third party um, could extract uh, additional information. Some of this additional information uh, will be used to improve the service. Uh, some other will be used to generate a very detailed profile um, of uh, a user in order for that user to be targeted very specifically with information. And that information could be desirable information like advertisements for products people are interested in or information that is aimed at uh, modifying the behavior uh, of people, for example, in the political uh, arena or in other uh, important aspects of uh, today's life. So what we are focusing on today is how the user, the uh, person on the left, um, will be able to uh, keep on sharing their in particular uh, images in order for them to be able to enjoy services uh, without uh, the data to be breached in, in any form. And in particular, we will consider the example of uh, image sharing in social media, where the objective is to uh, share information and images with our friends in order to uh, engage them in, in our experiences. And we know that even if uh, the objective is for those images to be seen by humans, that behind the scene, there are a number of classifiers that are looking at whether uh, the content we are sharing is uh, copyrighted or is inappropriate. And of course, these are inferences that we, we accept as part of uh, the free service we are, we are obtaining. However, behind the scene, uh, there could be additional uh, classifiers working, and those classifier will could be looking at the type of scene is depicted. Maybe a person is often going to a synagogue or to a church or, or to a mosque um, and might not want to share that information with, with a third party. Uh, information about age, gender, emotions, and the relationship between people who are, who are on those pictures. And certainly, uh, we are probably questioning whether uh, those type of inferences are done uh, through uh, a proper informed uh, consent on the side of, of the user. And so let me let me spend uh, a few slides now talking about uh, consent and this uh, importance of, of data that is shared today in ways uh, we were not used uh, 20, 20 years ago, probably even 15 years ago. So uh, consent and personal information are uh, two very important uh, concepts here in Europe. Uh, they are regulated by uh, the GDPR. Consent is uh, meant to be freely given, specific, informed, and an ambiguous indication of the data subject wishes. Data subject is uh, ourselves. Um, and personal data is then any information relating to uh, an identified or identifiable natural person, which is, which is the data subject. So these two concepts are uh, very important uh, with respect to uh, the use um, of, of images. And uh, at, at the introduction today, um, the terms ethical AI have been mentioned, and this uh, is part of this uh, very um, important and growing area of uh, applying uh, machine learning and in particular AI uh, in a way that is uh, in line with what our values uh, are. Now, why do we care about this uh, when we're talking about AI? Well, it's because we do have possibly some substantially contrasting uh, objective uh, at the moment. Um, we have the user on one side and uh, the machine a service on, on the other side. Uh, the user should provide, must provide consent and that consent must be, must be informed as defined uh, previously. Um, and uh, the data about the user should be minimized. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, data about a person, a data subject, uh, should be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. So any additional inferences that are not agreed upon by the user should or must be uh, avoided. But why those inferences are desirable? Well, they are desirable because we are receiving uh, a lot of free services and uh, a way to make sure that those free services are reaching the users is to extract other value from, from the data. So there is this uh, contrasting uh, objective of respecting uh, the privacy of a user and at the same time extracting information that is valuable for the companies who are providing us uh, with a service, but also additional companies that can make uh, take advantage of uh, the open source data that are shared on uh, social, social media. So there is this um, contrast and this contrast 
um, gives us the opportunity to try and exploit the characteristics of classifiers in order to defend the rights of a user. So what we are talking about is the situation in which uh, a system is optimizing its behavior and inf its information flow towards a user that is both the source and the target of a process. And we want to protect the user from undesirable inferences, we, meaning we want to defend a user from machines that are automatically extracting information that then is used to generate profiles about these users. And in particular, what we will be talking about today is how we can learn manipulations to protect the privacy of people while keeping on enjoying the services that are available uh, today. So we want to protect the private content of images from uh, automated inferences that are not desired by the user, for which an explicit and informed consent was uh, never given. And what you will hear quite a lot when people talk about privacy is that utility and privacy are contrasting objectives. And what I'm trying to uh, convince, you, convince you about today is that utility and privacy can go hand in hand. Uh, so the utility is uh, using a service at a level of service, which we are uh, happy with, and privacy is protecting uh, the personal information of a data subject. And I will show today how it is possible uh, to protect uh, privacy while maintaining the utility of a certain service, something that in a number of uh, situations have been shown not to be possible, but in the specific case of images I will show today, it is possible and uh, desirable. Before starting, I'd like to uh, clarify some definitions about uh, the classifier, uh, so M, uh, which we have seen earlier. So a classifier uh, is uh, said to be a white box uh, classifier when we have full access to its architecture and its parameters. On the other hand, it's said to be black box when we haven't got information about the architecture or the parameters of that classifier. And the only thing we can access is either the uh, resulting soft label, meaning the probability for each of the categorical classes uh, that the classifier was trained upon, or at the hard label, the decision, the final uh, classes uh, of interest, or we could even have no label at all. For example, whatever image you pass on in any free service uh, will be parsed by a number of, of classifiers, but we don't really uh, know unless we are expert what type of inferences are done in there. So uh, in the case of the black box, we will have access to, of course, the input data we provide and one of those three uh, approaches. And we will see how we can generate adversarial attacks uh, in cases where uh, we have a black box uh, scenario. And the black box scenario is also a scenario that allows us to query a classifier and uh, seeing the uh, output of that classification results for a large number of times. So if we want to uh, design an adversarial attack for these uh, good purposes, what should be its properties? Well, the first property is its effectiveness. So uh, we want it to be successful in evading a classifier. And uh, this can be done in a targeted manner, meaning uh, that uh, we are forcing the classifier to um, identify a certain specific class we want the classifier to detect or untargeted, meaning that we want the classifier not to detect uh, the, original, the original class. Uh, the second property is the robustness. Here is the robustness of the attack, not of the classifier. Um, in this case, we want uh, the uh, attack on the classifier to maintain its properties, even if the classifier uses some forms of uh, defenses. And uh, the third property, a very important one, is transferability, meaning that if I train a perturbation on a classifier, then the very same perturbation should be uh, effective in another unseen uh, classifier. And specifically, when we're talking about privacy, we want these modifications not to be uh, detected. And even if they are detected, we don't want the automatically the system would be able to recover the original the original class. So these are five properties that we will uh, mention uh, while discussing the various the various approaches. And I will uh, then share the slides with uh, with the organizers. So if uh, some of you are interested in uh, diving into uh, some of the work we have done in the past couple of years, uh, you can uh, follow those uh, references. These are um, recent uh, methods we have proposed in terms of 
um, evading classifier for uh, privacy uh, purposes and what are also the um, problems associated with classifier and in particular uh, the second work which i will mention at the end of the presentation is about uh, robustness for uh, autonomous uh, vehicles so uh, self-driving cars let's uh, see the first uh, method that we uh, developed um, it, it is a method that we called a private fast grid and sign methods um, and uh, this method is uh, an evolution of the uh, state-of-the-art fast grid and sign method method which uh, we modify in order for uh, the class uh, the classifier was uh, push uh, to uh, detect was uh, such that it was not the crown truth class we haven't mentioned yet uh, what the crown truth class compared to the original class and i think now it's 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 a time to to do so um a classifier uh, by definition will not be 100% uh, correct and therefore if we are generating an adversarial attack we have to make sure that uh, when we are flipping, when we are changing the results of the classification, we are not actually pushing that classifier towards uh, the correct uh, class. And therefore, we need to uh, be sure that the class we are pushing the classifier towards is with high certainty not the original class, because we have uh, the original class, uh, which is the one detected by the classifier, the ground truth class, which is the ideal class, and then the class uh, the adversarial attack is pushing the classifier to detect. And considering uh, the uh, original class, we don't want the original class to be flipped uh, by chance uh, towards uh, the ground truth class. And in order to do that, we select our uh, target class, uh, Y tilde, there on the bottom right, in a way that we will uh, mention later on, that is uh, reducing the probability that that class is the ground truth class. And in particular, the way through uh, the fast grid and sign method, uh, we are uh, looking at generating the adversarial perturbation is by using uh, the uh, gradient uh, of the cost function with respect of uh, the image. So when you're doing back propagation with deep learning, you're changing the value of the parameters based on the pair um, uh, annotation and uh, input signal in here you are uh, keeping fixed the value of the parameters and what you're changing are the values of the pixels. So you modify each value of the pixel um, by plus minus uh, epsilon in there uh, based on the gradient uh, with respect uh, to the image itself. So we are modifying the value of the image in order for the classifier to go towards our target uh, class. So uh, the perturbation, as you're seeing in the equation on the bottom right, is constrained by uh, epsilon, which is usually one or two quantization levels uh, of the image. And the goal there is to maintain the visual quality of the image. We don't want, in this case, to have very large perturbations. It's a, a targeted approach. So it's an approach that goes towards a specific class. And again, I will mention later how this uh, class uh, is detected. And it's an iterative method that it iterates until a certain classification probability is achieved. And in this case, because we are using the gradient of the cost function, this is a white box uh, attack, a white box method. So let's see one example of result uh, with this approach. So on uh, the top there, you see an image X, the original image. And on the right, you see the manipulated image, the image X dot. Uh, I hope that you agree with me that those images look exactly the same. Well, despite those images looking exactly the same, um, ah, the uh, classifier M, the same classifier, generates two different labels. The image on the left is classified as a church in terms of what scene it depicts. Uh, the image on the right, surprisingly, provides as output with the same classifier, the label Zen Garden. So we were in here successful in maintaining the quality of the image, the perceived quality of the image, while changing the label. And because we could manipulate the probability of uh, the classification for uh, the specific M, we actually made the classifier even more certain that that image was a Zen garden as opposed to a, a church. So you see in here that if we have access to the classifier, then we can manipulate the input in such a way that the classifier is wrong and feels very confident in this uh, wrongness. So here is a first example of how we try to protect the privacy of images, in this case, our religious beliefs, uh, when we share them online to avoid a profile of ourselves being built based on the type of images or the type of place we tend to uh, visit. 
However, uh, this type of perturbation are high frequency spatial perturbations. So we are changing each pixel at a time, trying to uh, slowly with each iteration modify the image to go away from the original class. So if you see the top left image there, uh, in the bottom row, you see uh, four different adversarial methods um, and uh, the type of perturbation they generate for those images. And you see that all of those are high spatial frequency uh, perturbations. So this is the type of noise that is added on the original image. Here is amplified so that you can you can easily see it um, on the RGB channel of that image in, in order for that image to be misclassified by the classifier M. So if I would tell you, hey, how would you defend uh, the classifier for, uh, from an attack like this, you probably would say, well, that's very simple. I will uh, take the input image. Uh, I would assume that that image is always perturbed. Um, before passing that image through my classifier, I would use a low pass filter, a median filter, and that median filter is very likely to flip back the class to the original one. So this type of perturbations that are generating high spatial frequency noise are not robust uh, to defenses and they tend to be defeated by a simple low pass filter or a simple JPEG requantization. So um, the two properties we were interested in, the first the robustness, the second the transferability because uh, this type of uh, changes in the input in the image are not likely to generate an error also in other classifiers. So we looked at ways in which we could transform this uh, private fast gradient sign method into a robust uh, method. And uh, the way we went uh, about this was uh, to, instead of using a simple classifier uh, to generate the perturbation, we used a, a set of classifiers and also a set of defenses that were used in each iteration in order to create um, a modification of the input image that was more transferable and more robust uh, to defenses. So uh, the way we went about uh, this was to generate uh, again um, an image that was moving in uh, the direction of the gradient with respect to the image, but for each iteration we changed randomly which classifier we created the adversarial attack for. But not only, also before generating that perturbation, we pass the image through a defense. So we had a set of defenses that are uh, known. And so we select at each iteration one defense and one classifier, and we keep on modifying the image until we are successful in our misleading objective. And what I'd like now to spend some time on is on how we can, in the targeted attack here, uh, generate uh, an image that is unlikely to be the image of the ground truth. So uh, the way we go about that is by uh, ranking the probability of all the classes. So um, imagine you have 365 possible classes a classifier will be able to uh, detect. Uh, we uh, sort and rank those um, probabilities and we uh, consider all those such as the uh, cumulative probability distribution exceed the threshold. And that threshold allows us to move away from a subset of classes that should contain the grand truth class, which is close usually to the original class that is uh, detected by, by the classifier. So uh, D is the number of classes and we sort those classes and we try and go away from uh, the original, of course, but also for the potential grant truth class in case it doesn't correspond to the original. I just want to give you here an example of what are the classes uh, in the case of a, a, a set of 365 classes. These are from the place 365 uh, data set. Um, and you see in here uh, our specific choice of gamma that allowed us to have um, a median number of classes 307 to randomly choose from to decide which was the targeted class we were going uh, towards. And I'm going to show here some uh, examples of results. So in this slide you're seeing uh, the original images and their estimated class. In the next slide I will show you the modified images and their corresponding class. So the class that the same classifier as as detected. And uh, you will see what type of um, noise has been added to those images. Here we are. So you see that um, all the nine labels had been flipped 
um, and uh, some uh, noise had been introduced in those images. Those images are still intelligible, are of decent quality, uh, but uh, despite representing an obvious uh, scene, you see that the label uh, was changed by the classifier. And uh, this perturbation is stronger than the previous one, and the strength is the cost to obtain, to obtain an adversarial example that is transferable across classifier and robust to defenses. So uh, with this type of approach, we pay in terms of visual quality, but we gain substantially in terms of robustness and um, transferability to other to other classifiers. Um, we talked about this amount of perturbation uh, that uh, we use to create an adversarial example. Uh, there are two uh, type of approaches. Uh, the constrained one, which is the one we mentioned uh, so far, where we have small, uh, usually norm bounded with the L1, L2, uh, L infinity norm. Um, these, unless uh, we are using the type of approach we mentioned earlier, they are usually uh, li with limited success uh, with unseen classifier, and unless uh, we are using the approach we mentioned earlier, they are vulnerable to uh, defenses. Um, and there is another family of um, perturbations, which are unconstrained perturbation, meaning that we are not trying to limit uh, the modification around a ball, uh, around the point uh, in the image space represented by the specific uh, input image, but we are trying to modify the image much more. And I will show you uh, an example of, um, of method that we have developed in this, in this area. So some of uh, the methods prior to ours were trying to transfer in new texture in the image. Of course, if you have an image, you start pasting some uh, different type of textures, you are more likely to mislead the classifier. But what we wanted to have is an image that looked very similar to the original one. And actually, if it is not shown by, side by side to the original image, then would be an image uh, that seems to be uh, natural. Then other um, authors uh, looked at how to shift randomly U and saturation value or recolorized uh, the, uh, the images. Uh, and these are the type of results they obtained. So you see that, for example, the uh, image in the middle and the image on the right are not particularly uh, appealing uh, and are not really the type of images you would like to, to share. So when we saw uh, this works in the state of the art, we said, OK, maybe we can do uh, better. We can uh, do this type of large-ish modifications, but at the same time we can uh, modify those um, those images. And uh, that is the method we presented earlier this year at uh, CVPR that we called uh, Colorful, which is a content-based uh, black box uh, adversarial attack. Um, so in this approach, instead of treating the image as a whole, we consider uh, the objects that are composed in this image. And in particular, we assume that those objects might undergo different types of color changes. For example, uh, vegetation will be changed in a certain color interval. Sky and water will be changed in a certain color interval in order for them not to appear synthetic or wrong. Um, if we detect a person, then we don't do any change at all because our human visual system is uh, very sensitive to any changes in, for example, skin color. And so a person, we don't do anything, vegetation, sky, and water. When we detect that class, we modify them in a certain uh, interval. And if there is another class instead, we just modify it uh, as much as needed uh, to flip the results. And we selectively modify that there for the colors. Um, and we use in particular the uh, LAB color space for reasons that we will see uh, later on. And let me show here an example of image X on the left and image X prime on the right, you see that the image is perfectly the same except for the color of the background, but just changing the color of the background allows us to trick the classifier into um, estimating the wrong label. So you see it's a substantial difference in label while having changed only the color of the background. So all of you who are interested in the robustness of the classifier can certainly use this type of approaches to study uh, how to make uh, classifiers more uh, robust. Here we have changed just the color of the background and we succeeded in defeating uh, the classifier. How does this method work? So you have the image on the left. We apply semantic segmentation. There are plenty of very effective methods now to uh, segment an image into its component objects. Um, and we detect the various classes we mentioned earlier. In this case, we detect a person and the background. And we apply a color perturbation, particularly only on the A, B, and components, so the 
chrominances of the uh, color space. We don't touch the luminance and we modify only the chrominances, in particular in the A, A, B color space, where we can uh, nicely control uh, perturbation with respect to the human visual system. And then we recompose back the image and we generate the uh, new one. We check whether the classifier is misled. If not, we try another modification with a smart way of randomly selecting the new uh, the new colors. And one of the advantages of this approach is that it can uh, work with images of any size. This is a bit of a uh, technical observation, but I think important for um, any of you who's working already in adversarial example. Usually the adversarial example works only for a very specific image size. In here, we can work with any possible uh, image size, and that's a, a, an advantage of, of the approach. Um, here you see the segmentation of a single person. Uh, now I would like to show you some other examples of segmentation so you get an idea of the type of separation of the image into areas. Each area is then modified within a specific uh, range in order to mislead the classifier. And uh, at the bottom you have uh, the uh, segmentation results where you have people in orange, uh, water in blue, the sky in cyan, uh, nature I believe in, in black, and then you would have uh, classes that are uh, different from, from this as well. So if a class is uh, none of the three, uh, then we will uh, apply any possible uh, change to the color as I will show you uh, later on. So um, I don't know now um, with uh, the system we're using how much interactivity we can have, but I'd really appreciate if at least the organizers would unmute themselves and uh, uh, play with this, uh, with this test I'm trying to do. So I will show you some images. And I would like you to tell me whether you think that the image I'm about to show is original or is an adversarial image. Shall we try and see whether uh, the audio works or at least uh, some? Well, I think mine works. Can okay. You, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. I can hear very well. So um, I cannot see the um, text box uh, at the moment. So uh, either your opinion or the opinion of the audience, would you relate to me, please, whether you think that this image is adversarial or an original image? I would say it's original. Looks very, very original to me. OK, you made my day. Thank you very much. This is an adversarial image. The original one is at the bottom. So that was exactly the purpose of the method. The idea was uh, to generate perturbed images with a substantially large perturbation in terms of energy of that perturbation that however by itself, not in a pairwise comparison, looked original. Let's try another one. Adversarial or original? Uh, that looks a bit modified, but I would say adversarial. Okay. Marco, uh, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Andrea Gasparin. Okay, that is the correct. Uh, estimation. In fact, the color of the clouds is a bit bizarre there, and probably in a, a future version of the method, we should have a more refined uh, way of modifying uh, those images. So the one on the top is adversarial, the one in the bottom is uh, original. Let's try this one now. Is it an adversarial or original image? I would say, well, it's hard to say, I would say adversarial for the grass at the bottom what do you say marco uh, adversarial i think that the color of the tent maybe is a bit off fantastic that's you have a fantastic eye in fact it's uh, adversarial and the original one is uh, down there i must admit that you are <laughs> the first two people who select the image correctly so co <laughs> congratulations um, and that gives us some some more work to do in order to make those perturbation even less uh, less visible. And the last example is an obvious example of perturbation. I wanted just to make sure that you see what type of changes we're doing. If you see this, you could think, OK, maybe they have fancy lights there because it's a party, uh, but it's the modification of the image like that. So you see on the top, those images are images that if you pass them through a classifier are misleading the classifier. So the label of the images on the top is different from the label of the images at the bottom. Um, however, as you can see, those modifications are relatively acceptable, especially if they are seen in isolation. Um, and uh, uh, especially they are large enough for a defense not to be successful 
uh, in uh, in reconvening back to the original uh, class. So let's see some other examples here. So these are images that are modified, and those are the corresponding original images. These are images that are modified, and these are the corresponding original images. So all the images I, I've shown as colorful images, I go back one slide, um, are images that are misleading the classifier. At this point, we also wanted to uh, do a, a proper subjective experiment. So we asked uh, 39 people uh, to look at 150 images, uh, 100 original, 150 original images, 150 images generated with colorful, and 150 generated with what was a state-of-the-art method at the time of some. be uh, original um, and with colorful we got 74 percent so the distance between uh, the number of people who on average thought it was original and colorful is not that large especially not that large compared to uh, what the other state-of-the-art method was generating in terms of adversarial uh, images but as you have seen with the uh, simple test we run uh, in uh, in this presentation we were not still fully satisfied with what uh, we did. And uh, we actually wanted to uh, to take another direction, which was, can we improve an image and also turn it adversarial? And here I'm going back to the claim I made at the beginning, where uh, I said the uh, utility and the privacy can go hand in hand. And uh, I will show you now uh, the method that we uh, develop that is going in, in that direction, and it's called uh, Edgeful. Uh, which is an adversarial image enhancement filter. So the idea here is that uh, image enhancement filters are modifying the image. And what we wanted to do is to insert uh, the adversarial noise inside the enhancement of that of that image. Um, and this is work we have presented earlier this year at ICASP. So in this case is a white box attack where we learn structure aware perturbation and we use a multitask loss function meaning a function that accounts for uh, enhancing the image an objective that aims at enhancing the image and the objective of misleading that image so here is one example of uh, image uh, that is non-modified and on the right you see an image that is modified with that with that filter so we have modified the appearance of the image think of your uh, instagram filters you, you apply on your images and within that uh, modification we modify we place the adversarial perturbation what generates uh, the error in the classifier in order that is not visible uh, to a human eye so we want the human eye to appreciate the human visual system to appreciate the image while at the same time that image been able of uh, misleading the classifier. And uh, just for those who are uh, familiar uh, with losses and uh, with fully co uh, connected uh, neural network, um, we are uh, considering two losses. The first one is a smoothing loss uh, in here, where we are learning a convolutional neural network, a fully convolutional neural network, uh, to uh, mimic uh, the way you would do uh, a smoothing. And then at the bottom here, we have an adversarial loss uh, that works uh, like the loss, uh, for those of you who know about it, of the Carlini Wagner uh, adversarial attack uh, that is pushing um, away uh, from uh, the logit score of the original of the original class. So in this case, unlike Colorful, we are working on uh, the uh, L component on the LAB color space. We do not touch the color. We just modify the luminance component and that is what allows us to uh, hide uh, the perturbation through the loss here, adversarial loss uh, in our our image. And I will show you now uh, some examples and then- uh, Sorry, sorry Andrea, just, just yeah. a question, sorry for the interruption. The, sure, uh, yeah. the smoothing loss is, is uh, affine to the uh, L2 norm regularization you usually use inside uh, in the neural networks training? Yes. The LS, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you, you, you're, you're trying. So there, the idea is that you want the neural network to train 
the smooth thing. Then we have extended these uh, to more generic filters. So the idea is that the neural network will learn a filter and then we'll use to generate that uh, that perturbation. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and here is uh, a set of examples of original images in here, and you will see uh, the results of the enhancement of the structure in, in here. So these are the edge full images. So these are images where we showed how by uh, enhancing uh, the structure, amplifying the structure in the uh, images, we could the, also uh, trick the classifier. So again, uh, we um, cast this problem into a problem of preserving the original uh, class of the images we are sharing. Um, but of course, you can use these very same approaches to uh, study the robustness of the classifiers, uh, should that be your uh, your goal. And if you want to play with that, uh, the code of all the methods uh, I presented so far are available in GitHub. Um, and again, I will share with the organizers uh, the slides uh, so that you can have access uh, to those uh, should you be interested in. And as you saw, there are a number of directions uh, that we can consider for uh, extensions of, of, this, uh, of this work. So uh, should you be uh, interested, please do not hesitate to get uh, in contact with um, with me. Now, um, have we got uh, some more time? Marco, I think we do, do we? All right. Okay, so let me uh, just tell you that there isn't only deep learning in the world. Um, and uh, uh, one of the works uh, we have done uh, was uh, simply looking at a Gaussian mixture model uh, for uh, drone videography. So when you use your drone and you take these very nice uh, videos of a certain scene, you're likely to capture uh, people even if they are far away. And uh, the quality of the cameras uh, today on, on, on nice drones are high enough that you could uh, pass a face recognizer on those images and recognize the people you have captured. So our goal was to maintain the quality of those video, but at the same time blur uh, when necessary uh, the face of people such that the video itself was still pleasant to see, but the identity of people could not be inferred from uh, the faces. So what we worked on is at a way in which we had a mixture of Gaussians whose parameters were smartly and randomly selected in such a way that they couldn't be uh, inversed. Um, and at the same time, this uh, variation of the blurring was such that uh, over time it was not uh, jerky and therefore it was not uh, unpleasant. And in here we used no uh, deep uh, learning uh, to introduce uh, the protection of the privacy of, of people and also we consider uh, the density of the pixels in the face of a person and when we consider that to be uh, low enough for uh, a human classifier or uh, for um, a, a, a machine learning classifier uh, to be able to detect the identity of the person, we simply did nothing on that on that phase. So this is one aspect I wanted just to uh, touch upon to uh, make sure that there is not only uh, a deep learning approach uh, to uh, to privacy. Um, and the second one, uh, very important, uh, that is uh, linking with what we said at the beginning, is about um, attacks on autonomous systems. Um, we do have uh, classifiers that are running on robots, on on prototypes of self-driving cars. And uh, these are safety critical applications. And there have been cases in which under specific experimental conditions, it was possible to apply some stickers on a stop signal in the real environment and through the sensors of um, existing self-driving cars. Um, that uh, stop signal was interpreted as a speed limit. And therefore, you can imagine that a decision on that uh, classification result uh, could be could be really uh, critical uh, for safety. And therefore, there is a lot of interest now in understanding uh, how to characterize the possible adversarial attack in the physical world, in addition to the on-signal perturbation, which are the ones that we mentioned today. However, in order to apply an on-signal perturbation in a uh, self-driving vehicles, in any forms of robots, you will need to hack that robot. And at the point, once you have hacked it, probably you don't need uh, to add that, that specific perturbation. And we uh, covered um, adversarial attacks for a number of sensor modalities, and especially what are the existing defenses uh, to those uh, attacks. And it's pretty interesting because those attacks can generate um, observations of objects that are not there, therefore false positives. They can hide objects 
and, and therefore generates a false and negative detection, or they can induce a misclassification of a detected object, like in the case mentioned before. So you just transfer uh, the uh, categorical label from one object to another simply by appropriately placing some uh, some stickers. And this is a really interesting uh, direction of research. In many cases, this applies only under very specific uh, capturing conditions, under very specific angles. It's not uh, generic, but however, there are today's some 3D printed objects that you can place in a scene and a camera will misclassify as another object or will hide a, a full objects in in um, in that video. And that's a very, very interesting direction of of research. With this, I'd like to uh, sum up what we we have covered today and go back uh, to what we started with that very simple classifier M that receive a signal in input X and generate a label. And I would like to uh, conclude with maybe four uh, direction I think uh, would be very valuable for further research. The first one is uh, to understand how to use those adversarial examples uh, to uh, train a better classifier. At the moment, if you generate adversarial examples and you're using them uh, in the training process uh, as well, you will lower the accuracy of the classifier. And the idea would be to maintain the robustness of the classifier up together with the accuracy, and that's uh, still an interesting open research area. Um, another interesting re open research area is how to look at uh, multiple uh, signal, like for example, not only images, but <coughs> images and audios or multiple uh, visual modalities and how you can make your system robust uh, through uh, this type of uh, multimodal uh, fusion of the input signal, or on the other hand, to generate attacks that are working for uh, multimodal fusion systems. One important aspect, I think, is that of the evaluation. So uh, all of you who are already working with machine learning are probably presenting their results in terms of mean average precision. Um, and in terms of robustness, we want really to look at the worst case scenario, edge cases that are really allowing us to characterize the behavior of, of the classifier. So the way we look at the evaluation uh, should probably be modified in order for us to take into account the cases like the adversarial examples that are pushing the classifier off uh, the cliff. And, and finally, really understanding why those adversarial examples are possible. There are a number of hypotheses going from the capacity of uh, the uh, classifier to the limitation of the training data, limitation in the computational uh, resources and the computation themselves that are available are all uh, possible hypotheses that people are formulating in order to explain why this very successful classifier are also so brittle uh, in terms of well-crafted um, examples. And, and certainly one uh, interesting area of research is that of uh, creating classifiers for which you have a certified robustness within a certain interval of any input uh, signal. So with this, um, I'd like to close uh, the presentation. But uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the people I presented the work of, uh, Janice, uh, Ali, Ricardo, Ricardo and Chanje, um, and um, Omar and Apostolos. Um, and uh, um, I also want to mention that if uh, any of you is interested in a software engineer or research assistant or PhD or postdoc position, we have uh, a, a number of open positions from now to, to the beginning of next year. So do not hesitate to get in touch. I'll be happy to have a chat with you. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, well, thank you for the superb presentation, really. Um, there are actually, and we still have got time, there are a couple of questions from the audience. And I do have two questions myself, if I have, if we have the time to, to do that. Um, I'll, go, I'll go quickly through them. So um, Gabriele is asking, uh, the modifications are meant to be permanent, as far as I understand. May we think to apply them just when the classifier works? Um, is that referred to um, autonomous systems? Uh, I might ask directly Gabriele. Gabriele yeah, you, uh, maybe Gabriele, you can you you may uh, activate your microphone to elaborate a little bit more on your question so that uh, you can actually uh, refer to uh, say to Andrea what part of his presentation presentation are you referring to? Oh yes, hello. 
Um, oh. Basically, I was thinking about the idea of modifying the image. I mean, mm, this looks great, of course, because uh, uh, it is useful and probably will protect the, the user. But let's say that mm, you propose this kind of uh, solution to users of uh, Instagram. I mean, mm -hmm. if I want to post a photo where um, the, I don't know, something is red, maybe I want it to be red. I mean, I won't accept a solution like this because uh, uh, I care more about the quality of my photo than my privacy. Because maybe I just ignore what, uh, um, I mean, all the background of this kind of uh, um, solutions. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that maybe this kind of modification uh, may be applied just when I know but supposing that I know that the classifier arm um, works. Yes, so I, 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 I see what you mean and you're perfectly right. Um, however, we are operating in this case under a black uh, box assumption, meaning that we don't know when and how the classifier uh, operates. Uh, so there could be some use cases where imagine a social media platform would say we care about the privacy of users and actually we provide you with this type of um, counter uh, counteract from the users not only to protect against us but also to protect against other people who might parse those images and generate profiles about people so that is certainly uh, one desirable direction and in terms of the preference you mentioned one of the projects we will be starting early next year is exactly about involving people to understand what their preferences are uh, so if you're interested in, uh, please drop me an email. I will I will involve you in the in the workshops we will be organizing uh, with people uh, to try and really understand uh, how to apply what we have developed here into a user facing uh, application that uh, is uh, respectful of privacy and respectful of privacy and also uh, is respectful of the preferences of the users. Sure, thank you. I get the opportunity to say, if you're organizing that workshop and you let us know as a society, we will spread the voice. We'll be oh, more than happy to do that. Yeah. And um, the second question is by Ricardo. I think, Marco, you already partially replied to that. Um, and it's something that I think you, you already replied during your presentation. But um, Ricardo is asking, what about training a new classifier, adding the images modified by the adversarial? But I think mm -hmm. you already said it during the presentation, is it? Yes, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's correct. That's an important direction. Uh, it's called adversarial training, meaning that those images that have been generated with the adversarial noise are new training examples <coughs> that are enriching uh, the image base that is used to modify the parameters of the classifier itself. So this is something that is certainly an important direction of, of research because at the moment, uh, people have demonstrated that this uh, increases the robustness of the classifier, however, at the cost of the accuracy of the classifier itself. So trying to understand how to modify those parameters of the classifiers, uh, of the classifier uh, with uh, the adversarial uh, examples uh, without paying in terms of accuracy <laughs> is certainly a very important direction of, of research. Some people are now looking at uh, the redundancy, the, the features, redundant features that are trained that are training the classifier in order to clean up what the classifier has learned out of the training set. So um, it's it's a more principled approach that is trying to uh, characterize what type of features are spurious and what type of features are fundamental for the classifier to learn so that when it's deployed, it doesn't get tricked by actually working on those spurious uh, features. Perfectly clear. I've got uh, two questions quickly. Um, so the first one is, is about a little game that we played. And the reason why I, did, for example, myself, I decided uh, or I recognized that it was an image altered in a image. It was just because maybe some curve of the greens was altered so the, the curve of the color itself and yes i'm talking about the rgb control um but this it can be also made uh, not with an adversarial attack you can use photoshop or it can be the camera itself so yes. my question is um does it alter 
the 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 the, the classifier also this, meaning that you you train the network I suppose with the original image, uh, let's say with a standard, for, just assume a standard camera, and then you you modify uh, artificially the image, but not a software engineer, but just a photographer or someone. Is it then the classifier making a mistake, or? Well, that, that, that's a, that's an excellent question, and and uh, this is linking to one of the most critical area of uh, involuntary, involuntary adversarial examples, which is in some medical applications. So there have been cases where, and this goes beyond deep learning; it's more machine learning in general. There have been cases where people have changed the instrumentation for which they were collecting in a medical imaging. And then the classifier generated results that were not uh, compliant with the initial specification. So this, the, the the change in hardware and how the change in hardware is impacting the cl the classification performance is extremely important for um, medical uh, applications. That there have been a number of notable cases of 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 this. So yes, you could uh, try and uh, make sure that your classifier is trained uh, using a set of variations of the images that might uh, mimic the way uh, different cameras would work. Yeah. Of course, this would be a, an empirical approach. It, it's much more desirable to see how actually to characterize this fragility of the classifier and understand uh, how to make them more robust by, by default. You mean? Oh, well, okay, and uh, the last question I had, um, if I got it right, so your idea uh, was to identify certain regions of the pictures that are not that, in a sense, relevant, um, in a sense, obviously someone is taking a picture of the sky, is the sky is obviously relevant, but um, in the case of people and so on, okay, you're trying to do this, but um, the, the color sometimes it can be a, a problem and so the, 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 the exact problem that uh, um, Gabriella was mentioning so the fact that then your your image is altered but what about uh, changing the characteristics or parts which are normally not relevant so for example um, networks can can easily recognize when it's blurred uh, something so something is on the background and is and it's blurred so you, identify those or, or for example black um black patterns which normally the our our eye can can confuse quite quickly quite quite easily is it possible to act on those parts uh, just on the those parts so you don't change actually the picture but at the same time have the result to mislead the classifier so yes that that's that's an excellent point that's one of the reasons why uh, we made uh, the software available is because uh, we really want people to build on on the work that was done in direction that are specific, like the one you mentioned. So I'm sure that people with a, a deep knowledge of photography would be able to uh, generate some very fine filters uh, that are also um, adversarials. And uh, in particular, what you're saying to explore the characteristics of the human visual system, one of the direction of uh, evolution of uh, uh, this work, in particular colorful, uh, is uh, that of not only, as we have done, generate five different classes, uh, one is don't touch, one is do whatever you want, and other three are, well, just operate within these boundaries. Uh, it would, the, the, the next step on this uh, initial approach would be to be much more refined on uh, the way you do modification. For example, uh, you look at the type of texture you have. If you have certain type of textures, it will be much easier to hide uh, the uh, the perturbation in there. Um, maybe also look at the various color components uh, and how we are more uh, sensitive to variations in, uh, in, in certain color components than, than others. So any exploitation of the way we look at uh, images uh, can be embedded in the type of attacks uh, we uh, we have developed. And it's just a matter of changing the way those color changes are introduced. So um, if you take uh, the, the code of uh, colorful and uh, you will change the functions on, that are generating that color by adding, uh, for example, a model of the human visual system or a model of specific parts uh, of the human visual system, that will generate uh, some, uh, some noise uh, that will be uh, better um, hidden inside uh, inside your image. We have recently submitted um, an extension of the ICASP work on Edgeful uh, that is looking at additional 
um, filters. And uh, I'm sure that a wider range of filters can be can be used, especially exploiting both uh, the characteristics of the human visual system and uh, deep knowledge on, on photography. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a super interesting topic. And I think we have the last question before we go. We'll leave the, um, the stage to Ginevra. Ginevra, don't, uh, no worries, we're not in a hurry. We started at uh, 45, so we, we will carry on in case until 5.45. So there's no reason to, to worry. Uh, there is a last uh, question. And um, I recently read the papers on adversarial attacks in neural language processing. And most of what you Na said... Natural today, language processing, sorry to... What did to I correction. say? Neural language processing. Okay, new, oh, neural language will be even more interesting. Natural language processing. And most of what you've said today seems to apply in that domain too. Do you think developing more robust algorithms should be a primary concern in all AI fields? Um, yes, I could I could stop by saying yes. I will elaborate a bit on that. Um, at the beginning, when I introduced the problem, um, I talked about a signal, uh, and then I said, "Look, we 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 will cover images today." Uh, in the group, we have worked on uh, audio, um, and uh, uh, we we believe that uh, both linguistic and paralinguistic uh, characteristics of audio are important. We have at the moment a, a work uh, under review in ICASP where we have looked at this uh, at this problem, and we are certainly interested also in in language uh, aspects. So how, for example, uh, to uh, modify? And actually, um, now that uh, you are referring to a natural language processing, um, adversarial attacks uh, to machine learning probably started with natural language processing when people started to evade. Uh, spam filters by uh, providing a lot of uh, white text on white background, so a machine would believe that that text was correct uh, text, whereas uh, all the uh, spam information was in black over white. So historically, uh, natural language processing is the area where um, adversarial attacks uh, have been uh, flourished in terms of uh, business activity. Uh, but today, once we start having these extremely powerful um, machine synthesizers for, for language like uh, GTP 2 and 3, uh, we really want to uh, be able to uh, understand how to uh, protect from uh, either malignous activities or from invasion of privacy. For example, would we want to uh, protect our uh, conversation from uh, digital personal assistants that are uh, listening to us in ways that uh, might not be acceptable. And therefore, there are a number of works with uh, physical adversarial attacks and also digital adversarial attacks that are looking at protecting uh, uh, voice, uh, spoken uh, language, uh, as well as uh, text uh, from uh, various forms of, uh, of attacks. So. Uh, Going back to the original answer, so yes, uh, here we should cover all the signals. And today we uh, looked at uh, images because uh, images are a really rich uh, set of uh, information uh, that are describing our lives and at times in ways that we are not really uh, realizing. That's why we are really now looking at the uh, amount of information that we are sharing online with images. And uh, we are not compromising only our own privacy. <clears throat> but we uh, tend to compromise also the privacy of, of others. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have we don't have any questions right now, so we can go on with uh, Ginevra. And so, Ginevra, if you can activate your webcam and yes. uh, microphone. Uh, I will quickly present you. Ginevra Carbone is uh, a PhD student at the University of Trieste. So she in, she's also uh, a fellow of uh, our Artificial Intelligence Student Society. And she will present us uh, a very recent work, which she, she presented last week at New Rips 2020. New Rips, for who doesn't know, uh, is a uh, 
the one of the top conferences in uh, neural processing, so neural networks and deep learning. And uh, here it is. She, the title of the work is Robustness of Bayesian Neural Networks to Gradient Based Attacks. So I think she will do a quick introduction on Bayesian Neural Networks to quickly update everyone of, on these models and then go on presenting her work. Yes, exactly. Thanks for the introduction and also for organizing this event today. And yes, as Marco said, I'm starting from an introduction to Bayesian Neural Networks. So let me use a very easy example. Suppose that uh, we want to train an image classifier. So uh, we have our neural network with a weight matrix W and uh, which receives an input image X that is classified by um, producing a probability vector. So uh, meaning that the, this probability uh, has, uh, has the dimension of the number of, of the classes and um, all of the components of this vector sum up to one. So they uh, allow us to perform uh, the final classifications. So what you will do in a, a classical deterministic neural network is to learn the best fixed parameters for the weight matrix. While uh, what we do in Bayesian neural networks is uh, we learn an ensemble of parameters that are very likely to fit the data. So this means that uh, each one of the weights in this uh, matrix W is a random variable and we want to learn the distribution of these random variables. So we do this by means of Bayesian inference, which uh, is based, of course, on uh, Bayes' theorem. And uh, we do this by uh, placing a prior over all the parameters, computing the likelihood of uh, these weights with respect to the uh, observed data, which is indicated by uh, D. And then uh, want to compute a posterior distribution, uh, which, uh, thanks to this theorem, we know that um, it is proportional to the product of these two terms. So the problem is that um, in the case of uh, Bayesian neural networks, obtaining the exact posterior distribution is an intractable problem. And uh, what we do instead is we rely on approximate inference methods. And here I'm just uh, mentioning a couple of methods that we used in our work. And uh, they are in particular variational inference, which is uh, an optimization based approach, and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a, a sampling based approach. OK, so uh, now I want to talk uh, about the adversarial robustness of BNNs, which is the uh, basically the last point that was touched in the previous talk during the conclusions. And um, of course, before talking about the robustness of uh, Bayesian neural networks, I need to uh, define a Bayesian attack. And um, what we would like to do in the case of Bayesian neural networks is to uh, attack attack the predictive distribution that we obtain in the end. And uh, this distribution is called the posterior predictive distribution. So uh, in general, a predictive distribution is the distribution of new observations given the past ones. For example, here a new observation is X star and the past observations are indicated by D, which, is, which represents the, the training data. And in particular, the posterior predictive distribution is simply the marginalization of the predictive distribution with respect to the posterior. So in the, in the end, if we want to perform a prediction on a new observation, uh, we simply consider an ensemble of predictions that we obtain from deterministic networks whose weights are sampled from the posterior distribution. So, um, for example, suppose that we want to define the Bayesian version of the FGSM attack, which was presented in the uh, last talk. Uh, what we do is um, we attack the posterior predictive distribution by moving in the direction of the greatest expected loss. So we do exactly what we would do in the deterministic case, but on an ensemble of posterior samples. OK, so this is the main contribution in our work. And um, I, oh, I was planning on giving a, like a very broad sketch of the proof, but I think it would be too technical. So let me just explain uh, this theorem in general. We have a fully trained, uh, over-parameterized Bayesian neural network on a prediction problem with a certain data manifold, which is called MD, and is embedded in uh, the RD space. 
And then we have a posterior weight distribution, PWD. Now, if we assume that uh, this manifold is almost everywhere smooth, then in the large data limit, uh, the expected loss gradients vanish on, on this manifold. So by fully trained, we mean that uh, all the deterministic neural networks in the ensemble are at full convergence of the SGD algorithm. By overparameterized, we mean that uh, there is an infinite number of hidden neurons in each one of the layers of the PNN. Then the data manifold is simply the support of the data distribution, PD. And finally, by large data limit, we mean that uh, we are supposing that our training data is infinite. So we have uh, a few very strong assumptions for proving this theorem, but um, in the end, the, the result is really uh, like strong and important. In fact, this theorem means that uh, in the limit of infinite samples from the posterior, all gradient-based attacks are ineffective against patient neural networks. And um, now I would like to uh, show you a few um, experimental results that we got to prove you that uh, even though the assumptions are very strong, in practice we observe this vanishing behavior on uh, real data sets. So let me skip the proof. Okay. Okay, in this uh, first plot, um, basically we are showing what happens towards the overparameterized limit meaning that both uh, the number of training inputs that are shown on uh, the right and the number of hidden neurons, which are shown on uh, um, the upper part of each uh, subplot, uh, are increasing. And here we are working on the Alphamon dataset, which has only two components, so we are showing uh, both of them. And we are computing, uh, we are using uh, 36 BNNs trained with HMC uh, to compute uh, these uh, expected gradients on 100 test points. And uh, as you can see, as the number of hidden neurons and training inputs increase, um, these uh, components tend to shrink towards zero. Now, uh, the second example uh, just uh, wants to give you an insight on uh, what uh, it visually means that uh, these gradients are vanishing. So uh, here we are computing the um, basically the, the expected loss gradients and also their uh, infinite norms, uh, which are shown uh, on the uh, upper part of the images on uh, two data set, MNIST on the first row and Fashion MNIST on the second row. And um, the red images are the actual perturbations that we are adding to these images. And as you can see, for an increasing number of samples, uh, their norms tend to zero. OK, so this uh, third plot um, is about the vanishing gradients components. So as we did in the first one, we are computing the uh, expected loss gradients on uh, other two uh, data sets, which are MNIST and Fashion MNIST, on uh, 1K test points. And notice here that uh, each one of the images belonging to these data sets have uh, 28 by 28 pixels, so a total of 784 components, which uh, are shown for all of the test points on the Y axis. While on the X axis, we are simply increasing the number of samples from the posterior. And also in this case, you can see that uh, these components uh, tend uh, towards zero. OK, now uh, the last plot uh, is very interesting because uh, we noticed that um, Bayesian neural networks show uh, a positive correlation between robustness and accuracy on the test set. So uh, let me describe these images in details. Um, first of all, we are using um, on the first row the MNIST dataset, on the second row the Fashion MNIST dataset, and um, on the first column uh, HMC uh, BNNs, on the second one VI BNNs. And um, here we launched a very big grid search on both deterministic neural networks and Bayesian neural networks. And the deterministic ones are shown um, as the blue dots, while the red dots are the Bayesian ones. And basically here we have on the x-axis the test accuracy and on the y-axis uh, um, uh, our definition of robustness, 
which is uh, one minus the softmax difference. By softmax difference, we mean here the um, average difference between all the softmax values that we obtained on uh, the original images and the adversarially perturbed images. So as you can see, uh, in the case of Bayesian neural networks, there is a positive correlation between these two uh, values, which uh, does not hold for deterministic networks. So mm, this is a very interesting uh, property. Now, finally, to the conclusions. Um, so there are many limitations, of course, in this setting because we uh, had um, strong assumptions on both the uh, architecture of the BNNs, which has to be overparameterized and trained on infinite data. And we also supposed uh, for our proof that the um, ensemble should be drawn from the two posterior distribution. And uh, finally, we assumed uniform priors on uh, the network. But uh, what we observed in practice is that uh, if we use very uh, accurate models, we already uh, have this vanishing behavior towards the limit. And also that uh, even if you are using cheap approximate methods like variational inference, for example, or uh, vague Gaussian priors, we um, also uh, obtain um, a behavior that resembles the one of the theory. And uh, finally, we also uh, found uh, this um, trend between uh, accuracy and robustness, which could guide us uh, in uh, choosing the, the most effective Bayesian neural networks in terms of, uh, of adversarial robustness, of course. So that's all for the presentation. And thank you for staying here until the end. If you have any questions. Let me just double check if someone has got questions so far. I do have uh, one, at yes. least, which is, um, so for the prediction, it means that you have to go through the through the forward pass several times and then average mm -hmm. or, some, or yeah. something like that. I don't know, with some strategy, I reckon. Um, do you reckon that this can be computationally a problem, for example, if obviously if this image recognition, it might be not a big deal. But for example, in the future for um, reinforcement, let's say, or when you have to make a decision quite quickly, so like self-driving cars or something like that, do you, do you see a potential uh, limitation or you don't think so? Uh, well, the uh, ensemble predictions on new samples is pretty fast, actually, even if you use a high number of samples. Of course, this can impact the computation of adversarial attack on the Bayesian neural network, so on the posterior predicted, because uh, a few adversarial attacks are uh, already very expensive themselves. And so if you add up the <laughs> add up the expensiveness of the method to the fact that you need to uh, use a high number of samples, then um, yes, it could be uh, computationally expensive. Uh, but the main challenge from um, a computational point of view is actually performing efficient Bayesian inference in this case. This is the most expensive part. OK, but this you mean during the the building of an actor, so the when you're training, training it. Yes. But my concern when were you actually using it? The yes. Network, so what do, do you think is not it's not a big deal? Uh, it depends on the application. So if you want to compute, for example, a very expensive attack, I don't know, Carlinian Wagner attack, then the uh, computational time that uh, you spend due to the attack is higher than the one coming from the the ensemble prediction, basically. Okay. And um, also FGSM, which is the fastest one, the, the easiest one, is very fast also in the Bayesian case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any any question um, from uh, the I'd, audience? I'd have one uh, if no other questions show up in the chat. So Ginevra, uh, just to enlighten me a little bit on the field of uh, uh, research in uh, Bayesian neural networks. Yes. Is it, um, how, how common is it for uh, Bayesian and neural networks uh, papers to, to be, uh, to results to be present, uh, to be presented on uh, uh, large data sets like uh, Cypher 10 or uh, the most common ImageNet? 
uh, it's pretty uncommon because uh, obtaining highly high accuracy on uh, the test set of these data sets is uh, diffi difficult, very difficult. And also uh, we tried experimenting with Cypher 10, but uh, we were not able to reach uh, high accuracy. And um, of course, uh, many people are working on making Bayesian inference more scalable from, for Bayesian neural networks. Uh, but it is still a challenge. So it's it's not a problem concerning maybe uh, it's something more like uh, you don't have uh, uh, algorithms, training algorithms that uh, scale well, uh, or is it that uh, Bayesian neural networks, how they are uh, thought of now, so maybe the initial distributions of uh, the priors, are not optimized for a large-scale training? Uh, actually, I suppose that uh, this would be less of a problem in the case of very uh, big neural net, uh, big, uh, sorry, data sets, because uh, as the number of training points uh, increases, uh, basically your prior counts much and much less. So the, the problem in this case is scalability, of course because you would need to train very big and deep neural networks and inference would be too expensive. And also they require more fine tuning compared to uh, deterministic networks. So of course this becomes okay. a problem. And Thank I'm you very much. To share my screen, okay. <laughs> uh, there is another question from Ricardo. Yeah. Um, he asked, one of the feature of the BNN are the confidence interval over a prediction. Does this interval increase in the adversarial object? And is the prediction with lower probability than on the deterministic NN? Uh, that's a good question. And it depends on how you are training your uh, Bayesian neural network. So it depends on the method that you're using, on how you are uh, basically building the architecture. For example, um, you could use uh, like a scale all the um, logic uh, um, vectors of your network, the final ones with uh, logarithms and get uh, um, or um, or don't use it and can um, get basically a different uh, confidence in your predictions uh, and obtain different results in the test accuracy, but also the adversarial robustness. So it depends um, a lot on the architecture and also on the method that you use. So I don't know in, in particular in our um, experiments because we didn't check this property, but yes, in general, it can vary a lot, I suppose. Is that okay for you, Ricardo, the, the answer? Okay, perfect. Um, like you would also, just to add something, yeah, yeah. So it's a very no good question and actually um, I think that uh, one of the main aims uh, would be also to get uh, low confidence in uh, predictions of out of sample data. So if you get samples that were really uh, far from your training data and really different, then you would like to, uh, of course, have more confusion in the probability vector. And this is another field of research that, uh, yes, that some people work on. Well, perfect. I think thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. Thank you. you made uh, clear some topic that is not easy at all, and that is really, really good. Um, I personally quite enjoyed it. And um, well, I think, Mark, do you want to say some word to conclude this session? Uh, from my side, I do want to thank all the speakers of today. It's been great. So for all of them, um, Professor Ansuini in the morning, Professor Botolusi, Professor Cavallaro, and um, is it Dr. Ginevra? Can can I say Dr. Ginevra? <laughs> you are opening like the Jill Biden. <laughs> okay, okay. But as long as we know each other, I say to you, Ginevra, thank you so much to be here to um, thank you. make this happen. I think it was really, really cool and s super interesting. So. Um, do you want to say some final word before we conclude, Marco? 
Yeah, just a quick invitation to all the PhD students, uh, bachelor students, master students, uh, professional master students, maybe from CISA or ICTP if there are some. Uh, an invitation to join our uh, association if you enjoyed uh, this event. We are, we are as uh, Andrea told this morning, we are an association which is currently growing. We are in need of uh, uh, collaboration for a new events. The hackathon we will be uh, conducting probably on March and uh, other